All right. Today is Sunday, April 17th. This is a recap for the stock market activities last week and an outlook for the week to come. Folks, I got a good one for you tonight, and let's not waste any more time. Here it is, in focus. More pain to come, at least according to this indicator. Now, before we talk about it, look at this. The so-called rebound rally topped the moment the inversion of the yield curve, we're talking about the 2 to 10, re-inverted, meaning the moment the 2 to 10 went negative and then moved its way higher again to positive territory, that was the top in the rebound rally, the so-called bear market rally. And this is an interesting phenomenon, by the way, because the assumption is when the yield curve steepens, this is good news for the equities market, but the problem is after the inversion happens and we see re-steepening of the yield curve, usually not not always, but usually we see the equities market recovering, and then about a year to two years after the inversion happens, we see a recession in the economy. And the equities market starts to fall apart well before that. But this is not what we're seeing so far. We're seeing re steepening of the yield curve, at least in the past week, yet the equities market is actually moving down, not moving higher, which is, in my opinion, an indicator that we will see a re inversion of the yield curve. Once again, this is not going to be the last time you see the 2 to 10 inverting. Furthermore, look at this. The number of consecutive days without record in the S&P 500. We're getting closer and closer so far this year to 100 days. But look at this. We're nowhere near the 2020 episode or even the 2015-2016 episode. My bet is we will see more days to come without new all-time highs. Matter of fact, we could beat the episode from 2015 to 2016. But the threshold is, let's say, around 120 days. If we have 120 days, without new record highs on the S&P 500, and the stock market is actually trading not sideways, but far below the all-time highs, it is an indicator that we're going to see more of that. And perhaps 120 days with no new record high will turn into 300 days with no new record high. Here's another one. Stocks are either cheap or expensive depending on how we look at them. And when we look at the chart, every time we see a reading above 5 basis points, it means that the stock market is cheap relative to the yield on the 10-year. If we use the actual 10-year yield right now, then stocks are not really that cheap. They're actually getting more expensive. The Tina argument goes out of the window. On the other hand, if we use the real 10-year yield, meaning factoring in inflation, which is at around 8.5% right now, then stocks are cheap, relatively speaking, because the Tina argument is still alive when we talk about the real 10-year yield, because the real yield in the 10 is actually negative when you factor in inflation. And hence, where are you going to put your money? You're going to buy the 10-year yield? Well, it's negative. The real yield is actually negative. And hence, the Tina argument is still alive if you're factoring in real yields. The problem is, however, when we talk about the Fed being behind the curve. This is exactly it, by the way. If you want to tackle inflation Volcker style, you got to spike the real yields above the inflation rate. And we are nowhere to even being close to that. So it all depends on what the Fed is about to do. If the Fed is about to take inflation seriously, and let's say in the May meeting, they surprise us by a 50 or maybe more basis points hike, and then they say in the next one, we'll do another 50 and we will be aggressive as aggressive as we can to destroy this inflation then real yields will move significantly higher and stocks will look expensive on both actual and real yields so you got to be careful here falling into the trap assuming that stocks are cheap right now but here's the indicator that spells trouble for the S&P 500 Wyckoff upthrust and the volume pattern signal more weakness ahead in the S&P 500 what are they talking about here it is on the 31st of March 2022 the S&P 500 E-mini futures experienced a Wyckoff upthrust, a UT, pay attention now, of the previous resistance created by the automatic rally AR in early February 2022. This was the first, not the first, but it is the first red flag, it's a typo here, of the beginning of the downswing to test the support. So where is the support, you might ask? Well, the Wyckoff upthrust, also known as a false breakout, 
is a typical event where the smart funds sell into strength to unload their position, while the majority of the retailers buy into the euphoria because of fear of missing out on the strong rally. And I told you before, FOMO is for the dumb. The only people who practice FOMO are dumb people. Good things come to those who wait. So what is the Wyckoff up thirst pattern? What are you talking about here? We can simplify all of that by calling it a false breakout. But here it is, since mid of February 22, S&P 500 showed the inability to follow through to the downside, with a shortening of the downward thrust despite the bearish sentiment, suggesting supply absorption in progress, which was confirmed by the short covering rally in March 2022. And look at this. And again, this is not clear to see, it's a blurry picture, but you see the SC marking, this is the selling climax. And then after that, you have the automatic rally, AR. And then you go down, secondary testing, before we see the UT, which is the false breakout, the Wyckoff upthirst, which usually happens to be a sucker's rally. And we see a massive flush down from that point on. And the unique pattern of the Wyckoff upthirst is the wide range of trading. Look at how wide the range is from the selling climax all the way to the automatic rally. So the question here is, where is the next support? The short covering rally was overextended and a Wyckoff upthirst showed up on the 31st of March 2022, where the breakout of the resistance formed by the automatic rally AR was violated. Increasing supply was observed in the volume during the upthirst. Thirst. Subsequently, the downswing was accompanied by high consistency of supply together with a widening of the price spread suggesting supply is dominating. Failure to commit above the axis line at 4,450 where the support turned resistance signals continuation of the downswing. And pay attention now, should the support area between 4,380 and 4,400 failed to haul, the S&P 500 is expected to test the next support area at around 4,200 and 4,280. So far, the S&P 500 is still trading between a big trading range, 4,100 and 4,600, as defined by the selling climax, the secondary test, and the automatic rally. The directional bias is still to the downside because of the sign of weakness broke below 4,600 back in January 2022, until proven otherwise. Market volatility is still excessive, which is not a part of the characteristics for Wyckoff accumulation structure. It is useful to adopt the Wyckoff method, analyze the characteristics of the price action, such as the price spread, velocity, and progress together with the supply and demand as reflected in the volume to form a directional bias as the big trading range is still unfolding. Look, I mean, in my opinion, all of this is voodoo science. They can make up whatever they want and explain after the fact. I just read the charts old school. You got support, you got resistance, you got things we call bear market rallies. You combine that with the fundamentals, the Fed policy, the macro, the commodities futures, and you'll do just fine trading the stock market. You don't need Wyckoff, Voodoo, whatever that is. But it is an interesting theory that we have to take in consideration because they're identifying exact supports. And in this case, it's going to be at around 4,200 on the S&P 500. We will look at that when we talk about the charts analysis. But for now, we got to move on and cover the market information for you. We start with the performance of indices last week. And here we go. On Thursday, the Dow Industrial Average was down 113.36 points, or a decline of 0.33%. The Nasdaq, the decliner of the day, down 292.51 points, or a decline of 2.14%. The S&P 500 was also down by 54 points even, or a loss of 1.21%. Here is the sector's performance on Thursday. Everything is down. We're not going to give any medals at all because... Every single sector of the market was in the red, led by technology, communication services, and cyclicals. When we contrast this with the weekly performance, at number one, capturing the gold medal, energy. And at number two, for the silver, materials. Number three, for the bronze, defensives. The laggards, once again, were led by technology, communication services, and healthcare. What about the advance to decline ratio on Friday? Excuse me, Thursday. We did not have Friday. But here it is, NYSE, 37% advancing versus 59% percent declining. The Nasdaq, 30% advancing versus 66% declining. Moving on to commodities, and most futures were open for trading on Friday, be it at a thin volume. Regardless, we're seeing alarming developments here, specifically when it comes to energy. For example, the WTI on Friday gained over 2%. Likewise, Brent, 
Closing the day with gains of over 2.5%, gasoline was almost up 2.5%, likewise, heating oil. Closing the day with gains of almost 3%, and natural gas, the momentum in natural gas is stunning, scoring gains of over 4.5%, on Friday alone. On the other hand, muted action for softs across the board, whether we're talking about cocoa, cotton, OJ, coffee, lumber, sugar, all muted, no notable move at all. Similar story with meadows and meats, with the exception of lean hogs. Lean hogs closed the day with gains of almost three quarters of a percent. When it comes to grains, mixed picture, a decent rally for rough rice. And by the way, I got into rough rice. And the reason is we have a shortage of corn. So there is a shortage of animal feed. Now, they can use rice as a substitute for corn, but you're not going to use rough rice for that. You use Thailand rice or Indian rice. Yet in empathy with other rice fuel Futures, we'll also see rough rice taking a leg higher. And by the way, theoretically speaking, you can use ground rough rice as animal feed, but it doesn't matter. The technicals are moving higher in rough rice. Likewise, we got gains for corn, soybean oil, soybean meal, soybeans, canola, be it modest gains, yet notable. On the other hand, we have decliners in wheat down almost 1.5%, and then a massive profit taking in oats down a little over 5%. Here are some commodities news for you. When we talk about the momentum in natural gas, look at the shortage in storage for natural gas here in the United States. We are at the lowest levels since 2019, and granted, the storage levels are seasonal. We store more ahead of the winter season, and then we use that, and we have to top off the storage. Here's the problem this time around. We have competition. We have more demand than just the domestic demand. We now have Asian and European consumers competing on U.S. liquefied natural gas. What does that mean? The government at some point, perhaps uh, soon, will have to top off the storage of natural gas, meaning they have to buy more natural gas. So we now have more tailwind for nat gas prices to move higher. Because you have the domestic demand, the European demand, the Asian demand. Where is the supply, by the way? It is nowhere to be found. It is there. We have an ocean of natural gas in the U.S., but you have to get it out of the ground. In the meantime, this dynamic between supply and demand pushes prices higher. And luckily for us, by the way, we could have seen natural gas prices right now north of 8, maybe 10 per BTU. The only thing that prevented that from happening was the mild winter that we had in this country. Yet in the next season, if temperatures, the expectations for temperatures to be down, then that will be another tailwind for nat gas prices to move higher. Let's talk about OJ. Why did we see the magnificent rally in orange juice as of late? Here's the answer. Orange juice stockpiles are shrinking, pushing prices higher as Florida faces its smallest crop since the Second World War, and Brazil grapples with depleted inventory. Now, I would actually short OJ at this point because it got technically overextended, but the tailwinds are still intact. The supply is nowhere to be found. On top of that, when we talk about fertilizers, we have more tailwind for fertilizers to move higher. CF says rail delays to further shrink U.S. fertilizer supply. We're talking about names like Mosaic, Nutrin, ICL. All of these names will benefit from higher fertilizer prices. But here's the alarming story, by the way. And so far, the media hasn't been paying a lot of attention to this, but poultry prices, eggs prices are moving significantly higher. Why? Because we have the avian flu that is now spread up to 27 states. And you're seeing eggs prices, by the way, moving significantly higher. On Friday, the U.S. Department of Agriculture announced yet another outbreak. This one in two flocks in Idaho, making that the 27th state in which the virus has been found since February. According to the USDA, the price of a dozen eggs in November hovered at around one buck. Now, I'd love to find out where they sell a dozen eggs for one buck. The neighbor's house, maybe? But besides that, right now, that price, the one buck, went higher to 2.95 bucks. Let's make that three. So we're talking about eggs prices tripling since November. Are you starting to feel this inflation now? Are you starting to understand the urgency of the Federal Reserve acting right now because we have multiple factors impacting inflation higher. The reckless monetary policy, the insane demand in the economy, the shortage of supplies due to the lockdowns in China, the war in Ukraine, the drought in the West and Brazil. And on top of that, now we have a new strain of the flu impacting the poultry and egg supply in the country. Unbelievable. So far, about 1.3% of all U.S. chickens have been affected in this outbreak and about 6%. The U.S. turkey flock 
said Grady Ferguson, Senior Research Analyst for Grow Intelligence, an agriculture data platform. Moving on to the big casino, the options market, what's going on here? On Thursday, the hottest table was ample by far at around 1 million contracts. And notice this, they're buying more calls. They're buying the dip via calls. We've seen the ratio moving from 55, 58 to now 61.7%. And number two, Tesla, the souffle, at around 900,000 contracts, about 56% of those were calls. And at number three, Twitter, at around 750,000 contracts traded for the name, about 58% of those were calls. And let's check the implied volatility for a second here. Twitter at 97%. What does that mean? In all likelihood, Twitter will start to go down from this point on. Forget about the fundamentals and the drama with Elon Musk. The technicals alone, the mechanics, say this stock is stopping right now and it's about to move down in a significant way. The only thing that could contribute to Twitter moving higher again, and this is why I wouldn't bet against it, is if we have more bids. Meaning, Elon says, I'm going to pay $50 billion for it. Somebody else comes out and says $60 billion, $70 billion. Then Twitter will explode higher due to short covering. Another notable name is AMC, around 17% IV percentage. Meaning that the implied volatility at AMC went down dramatically. So we have a move coming. And the thinking for now is, the move will come to the upside. The problem is, look at the equities market right now. You look at cryptos. We're seeing risk off, not risk on, which doesn't support. AMC moving higher from this point on. We'll see what happens. But here are the unusual activities that took place in the options market last Thursday. We start with the ticker IYR. This is for the real estate ETF. They're buying puts once again, in this case the 98 puts for the expiration date May 20th, with the expectations that the name could go down by more than 10% by then. They paid around 50 cents a piece to enter. This trade all in all spending around $650,000. What about the ticker INTC and Intel. They're buying calls this time around. Interesting. The 52 calls for the expiration date, May 27th, with expectations that the name could move higher by more than 14% by then. They paid around 40 cents a piece to enter. This trade, all in all, spending around $300,000. What about the trade for the ticker XLK? This is the technology ETF. In this case, they're buying the 132 puts for the expiration date, May 20th, with expectations that the name could go down by more than 10% by then. They paid around one buck and 20 cents a piece to enter. This trade, all in all, spending around $600,000. What about the trade for the ticker OXY Occidental Petroleum? In this case, they're buying the 64 calls, betting for more gains for the name, with the expiration date of April 29th, expecting that the name could move higher by more than 8% by then. They paid around one buck a piece to enter. This trade, all in all, spending around $500,000. Continuing with interesting trades, what about the trade for the ticker DOCN? This is a company by the name Digital Ocean. The name is already in the toilet, but somebody's betting that perhaps it could go down in the sewer. They're buying puts, the 45 puts for the expiration date, May 20th, with expectations that the name could move down by more than 14.5% by then. They paid around two bucks and a half a piece to enter. This trade, all in all, spending around one and a quarter million dollars. What about had the ticker TWTR Twitter. They're buying puts already. The 42 puts for the expiration date this upcoming Friday, April 22nd, with expectations that the name could move down by more than 7% by then. They paid around one buck a piece to enter. This trade, all in all, spending around half a million dollars. What about the ticker NUE New Core? They're buying puts, the 140 puts for the expiration date, June 17th, with expectations that the name could move down by more than 15% by then. They paid around three bucks and a half a piece to enter. This trade, all in all, spending around one and a half million dollars. What about the ticker double A Alcoa? It is about to report earnings this week. Somebody's buying calls already. The 105 calls for the expiration date, June 17th. With the expectations, that the name could move higher by more than 20% by then. They paid around three and a half bucks a piece to enter. This trade, all in all, spending around $1.4 million. What about the ticker PTGX? And this is for a company called Protagonist Therapeutics. The name is down big, and it was down big on Thursday, down over 20% in a single day. Somebody's bidding for a rebound, perhaps some short covering here, by buying the 22 and a half calls for the expiration date, May 20th, with the expectations that the name could move higher by more than 13% by then. They paid around three bucks and 70 cents a piece to enter. 
this trade, all in all, spending around one and a half million dollars. What about the trades for the ticker QQQ, the NASDAQ? They're buying a call spread here. They bought the 367 calls, and they sold the 369 ones, all for the expiration date, May 13th, with expectations that the Qs could gain more than eight and a half percent by then, but not more than nine percent. So the range is tight for this one. They paid around 90 cents a piece for buying the 367 calls, and they received around 75 cents a piece from selling the 369 calls. All in all, spending around 15 cents a piece, bringing the total to around $55,000. The structure for this trade gives you the impression of lack of confidence or conviction that the queues will make it over there. And lastly, what about the trade for the ticker EXPE Expedia? The travel names all moved higher last week on the heels of Delta Airlines earnings, and now they're betting that Expedia could move higher too by buying the 220 calls for the expiration date, June 17th, with with the expectations that the name could move higher by more than 15% by then. They paid around five bucks a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending around $1.8 million. Moving on to the heat map analysis, a bloodbath across the board, specifically for the big caps, which is alarming by the way, because we talked about the software high beta names getting shot. That is normal. The meme stocks getting shot. The RKK kind of names getting shot. But soon enough, they're going to move toward the big caps. Once they start shooting at the big caps, you see the indices declining dramatically, and it marks the beginning of the end of the bull run in the indices. On the other hand, the gainers last Thursday were names like AppV rebounding from the recent losses. Likewise, we have gains for both Deer and Caterpillar. Along with Nike, we got some unusual activities in the options market buying calls on Nike that pushed the name higher. Let's contrast this picture with the weekly heat map, and here it is, the performance coming from the inflationary names, energy, industrials, specifically certain areas of industrials. We're talking about deer, the agricultural names, materials, mosaic, nutrient, all of these names led the gains last week, along with participation from airlines on the heels of Delta Airlines earnings and the participation of cyclicals this time around. Let's zoom in and you can see names like apparel names, travel names, the hotels, Marriott, Hilton, the casino names gained big last week. I don't believe these gains will last for these names, but let's zoom out and talk about the weekly heat map once again. The damage in the big caps is really notable because we talked about names like the me i tweeted this meme by the way the massacre of comedians you got bob saget gone you got gilbert gone you got norm mcdonald gone and if i was jeff ross i'll be shopping for caskets right now but the moral of the story is meme stocks got shot rkk got shot the k-web the chinese names got shot what's next the big caps the big caps are next and they say these things come in threes and gilbert got the shot for jeff Jeff Ross, not in the stock market, baby. There is no threes. The big caps are going down. Look at Amazon, for example. Amazon CEO Jassy came out and said, we're going to improve the worker safety, yada, yada, yada. We got a report that we have more injuries in Amazon for workers than any other company. So now they have to spend more on worker safety. What are they going to do? Spy on their phones? But perhaps this is the motivator for improving the workers' safety. Maybe they need their workers for a little more, a little longer. In 2013, Jeff Bezos revealed an ambition or ambitious plan to fill the skies with delivery drones. Nearly 10 years later, internal documents and interviews reveal Amazon's program is still a long way off and has been hit by technical challenges and safety concerns. You combine that with the unions and say goodbye to Amazon. But here's another stock that perhaps will hold a little better. How about P&G? Procter & Gamble. They're moving dividends higher by 5%. The name is reporting earnings this week. The assumption is if it goes down, you might want to buy it here to enjoy this increase in dividends. And it is a name that tends to outperform in recessions and economic downturns. Another name, Krispy Kreme, the ticker donut, DNUT. They're tying donut prices to the average price of gasoline on Wednesdays to offer inflation relief. Oh, really? I think it's a smart move. It's a wicked smart move by Krispy Kreme. If you're betting that inflation is going to move higher and higher and higher, then guess what? You tie your product's price with the average gasoline price. Next thing you know, the average price at the pump is 10 bucks a gallon. And here we go. We have to pay more for Krispy Kreme. And you cannot blame it on price gouging. You got a problem with our donut prices? Go talk to the pump. Anyways, let's talk about Toyota. Toyota was down big throughout the week. And the reason is we have a recall for Lexus. 460,000 cars recalled. On top of that, now Toyota is warning. They're issuing a warning to the dealers 
not to take too many Corolla GR orders. As if Toyota is saying, hey, we got no supply. And these people are going to wait for a long, long time. Which means Toyota's earnings not going to look so hot so. Another one, Peloton. Peloton stock halted and tumbled. Why? Because they're increasing the membership prices. This is a dying company, folks. It's going to be delisted, I promise you. They sold all the bikes that they can. They're not going to be able to sell anymore. So they have to juice their existing customers for more membership fees, apparel, uh, coffee mugs. Netflix is also facing the same thing. The difference is Netflix has millions of subscribers. Peloton has what? 3 million? 2 million subscribers? That's it. The company topped off at 2 to 3 million. I say the next step is bankruptcy. But look at Walgreens. On the other hand, we have Indian tycoon Ambani who wants to bid for Walgreens. So you thought the Twitter bid is interesting. Wait till you see that one. Perhaps this one you can make easy money from Walgreens. And lastly, look at the defense contractors, Lockheed, Raytheon. They're holding a lot better than the rest of the market. And the reason is we have more deals, more new deals by the day. Now, Poland wants to get new air defense systems after the summer. Where do you think they're going to buy this new air defense system? U.S. companies, the likes of Lockheed, Raytheon, General Dynamics, etc., etc. So we continue to be bullish on these names. Let's move on to the heat map, the weekly heat map for the ETFs. Energy was okay, XOP, XLE. OIH up big along with materials, the XME specifically. XRT retail got a nice boost because of the reopening names bouncing higher after Delta Airlines earnings saying that the consumer is good to go, they're flush with cash, and the demand for the reopening is high, high, high. We'll see how that works out. But the losers were led by what? Led by the technology names, the XLK chips the soxx soxl down big the biotech xbi was down big so all of these high multiple names high multiple etfs well they got hit hard last week look at the contrast between growth and value both in the red but value at performing growth we look at the international markets down across the board on the other hand vix proxies moved higher a little bit gold continues to outperform the gdx the gld all moving higher when we zoom in to commodities the best performer was ung natural gas up over 14 percent for the week and of course the leverage etf for that is the ticker boil b-o-i-l which happens to be popular among the retail crowd the gains on that one exceeded 31% for the week. So if you're looking for a bull market within a bear market, here it is. Let's move on to charts and we start with SPY, 30 minutes chart. What do we see here? The bulls were hoping for a rally under the low volume week, but here's the problem. I tweeted this on Thursday. Both the S&P 500 and the Nasdaq lost important support lines and reversed all their gains from yesterday. Yields and oil are surging again. I guess the peak inflation narrative has been transitory. And here's the problem, folks. When you look at the 30 minutes chart, for example, the bulls had everything set up for them. The low volume, the shortened trading week, the peak inflation narrative. All what they had to do is run the chart higher, perhaps to close the week above 4.46.5 or even 4.43. Just close it flat. This is all you got to do. Now, the fact that they failed to do so and they got rejected from 443, they lost that support. And by the end of the day, they lost 438 as support. Not a good sign here, folks. When it's so easy for the bulls and they lose either way, you got a problem here. We're going down. How far down are we going to go? Well, the next support we got is 434. If that doesn't work out, we got 430, which is the line in the sand, by the way. Me, Personally, I'm going to wait for 430 and see what happens at that point. If we have a massive flush down all the way, let's say tomorrow and then Tuesday, and we get all the way down to 430 and then Netflix's earnings come out, you know, I mean, how bad is it going to get? The stock is already down big. Let's say Netflix earnings come out minus any bombs, minus any unpleasant surprises just okay we see netflix rebounding higher and from that point on the spy for example rebounds off 430 i'm just reading the tea leaves for you and here's the daily chart for the continuous contract for the spy the s p 500 at the time of the recording of this video it appears that the chart lost 4384 and a half of support which kills by the way the bull flag theory and it kills the abc pattern theory and the reason is the chart is now trading below half of the body of that jump rebound higher whatever you want to call it doesn't matter to me so we don't have 
a bull flag. We don't have ABC pattern. We have negative divergences in both the MACD and the RSI. Even when the volume was down, they failed to move this market higher. And if anything, on Thursday, the market reversed all of the gains from the prior session, and it lost an important support in 4,384 and a half. Not a good sign here. If we have a flush down scenario, we could go down to 4,232 and look for support down there. Now, let's pull our bull glasses on for a minute here. Usually, not always, but usually, we see reliable bottoms in a gap down scenario, and then the dip gets bought right away on higher than average volume. That is a reliable sign for a bottom. Could we see that happen tomorrow? I doubt it. And the reason is we haven't seen earnings yet. We're going to see a little more. Maybe after Netflix, the sentiment will change. We will get a bounce. Something to think about. But for now, don't touch it. Let the chart show us where the bottom is, at least for now. And here is the cash index, the daily chart for the SPX, well below the 200 days moving average, did not make it by the end of the week. And the negative divergences persist for both the RSI and the MACD. No bueno here. We're not doing anything. You got to show me a reversal. You got to show me something here to work out with and say, okay, we got a dip worthy of buying here. Nothing in this chart show us that. Here is the Qs, an hourly chart this time around. And again, it was so easy for the bulls. They already got 343 as support. All what they had to do is move a little higher, close the gap, and maybe recapture 352 as support. At least they could have kept 343 as support intact by the end of the week. They couldn't even do that. And the chart lost 343 as support. What does that mean? It means 343 is not a strong support. And I've been saying this over and over and over again. So what is the next support? We have 334. If that doesn't work out, then boy, we're going to go down all the way to let's say 360. 16 and a half. And if that happens, the NASDAQ would erase all of the gains in the so-called bear market rally. Here is a daily chart for the continuous contract for the NASDAQ. Again, at the time of the recording of this video, it appears that we're going to open an ugly opening. We're going to have a gap down because the chart lost 14,000, an important support, which by the way, takes the reverse head and shoulder formation out of the window for the bulls. And we're now looking down at 13,599 as the next support. The volume was down on Thursday, yet the bulls did not take the advantage and they lost 14,000. It's not just that they didn't take the advantage by rallying the indices higher. They couldn't even keep the support lines. They lost 14,000. This is a bad sign, folks. We have negative divergences on both the RSI and the MACD indicator. We got to wait for a bottom. Let's see if 13,000. 599 offers that or not, because if it doesn't, then maybe 13,300 will be the point of the rebound. Moving on to the IWM, the Russell 2000, an hourly chart. Look at this. It peaked above 201.68, the number we've been talking about. It attempted to close the gap. It didn't even close the gap, and it reversed all of the gains by the end of the day. But the good news for the IWM is the following. It continues to hold on at 196.5 as support. Unlike the Qs, the SPY, both of those lost important key supports. Not for the IWM, though. Can we read anything here? Yeah, it is a good sign for the bulls that the IWM held on, but it was due to the outperformance of the reopening names, the hotels, the casinos. How long will that last? I don't think it's going to last for too long. The Dixie, the dollar index, continues to move higher and higher and higher. Every time you think it's over, it continues to move higher. And we're now looking at 100, perhaps 103 as the next resistance if this rally continues to go on. Yet this rally is not stopping gold from moving higher. Gold is popping higher at least at the time of the recording of this video, it appears that the momentum, the positive momentum, is firming up, pointing out for more gains for gold. What about oil? This is a four hours chart. We have a bull flag, which was a result of yet another bull flag. And now the chart is trading firmly above 105.84, which makes the next target at 118, the next resistance target. But we also have around 114. That is a soft resistance right there. If the chart makes it above that number, 114, then we have 118 and if the chart makes it rapidly let's say by tomorrow for example i will be booking profits right here because we will have technical extension at around 118 it doesn't mean that the rally is going to be over but it means we could see a pullback a profit taking stop before the rally resumes higher again the 10-year yield this is a daily chart just like the dollar continues to move higher every time you think it's over it pops higher again. Even though we have technical overextension on the RSI, the MACD, doesn't matter. 
the 10 year yield is on fire. And if you think this is impressive, look at the two year yield, for example, to the moon, which means that the TLT, this is a weekly chart, is flushing down in a really painful and sad manner for the bond bulls. And now we have to identify 109 and a half as the next support. Technically speaking, it's a little above that, at around 111, but I'm being conservative here. You can look at the chart and say, but hey, Maverick, the indicators say that this is way oversold. Isn't it due? for a rebound? Yes, it is. But for now, do we have any signal at all? Looking at the candles, at the action that tells us that the rebound is near? Of course not. We have to wait for a reversal in the 10-year yield. We have yet to get any reversal signal at all. What about the VIX? Four hours chart. It got a nice rejection at around 24.29 and it flushed down all the way, not losing 20 by the end of the week, which was a major victory for the bears. Not the VIX bears, but the SPY bears. Now, what are we seeing here? We're seeing the MACD indicator, for example, firming up once again. Those red impressions in the histogram, they're getting shorter and shorter and shorter, indicating the VIX is about to pop again. But 24.29 remains a stiff resistance for now. What does that mean? If the chart makes it above that number, if it breaks above 24.29, we will see a lot of energy produced and perhaps a massive pop higher in the VIX. And that could be coming hand in hand with an ugly day in the indices, but we'll take it one step at a time. What about the VXN from a four hours chart perspective? Similar story here. The most important factor is the chart is keeping 27 and a half as support. And look at the MACD indicator. It is firming up once again. It has plenty of room to go higher, which means the Qs, the NASDAQ has plenty of room to the downside. We're talking all the way down to 316 and a half. And give me a chart of Apple, a daily chart, and ooh. Oh, no, 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 no. A massive reversal for the most important chart, the most important stock in the stock market, in the NASDAQ specifically. It did not even make it to 172.4. It lost an important support line in the trend line in yellow. And now the inevitable destination is 157 as support. We have negative momentum, negative divergences on both the RSI, the MACD, the name law lost 3% on Thursday alone. This is a bad sign for Apple. If it is a bad sign for Apple, then it is a bad sign for the rest of the market. Tesla, the souffle and hourly chart, this is going to be a house of pain for a little while. And the reason is Elon Musk's involvement in the Twitter fiasco, the backlash, and now they're saying we have to punish Tesla. But technically speaking, the stock made it all the way to 1,025. We talked about that number, closing the gap, and it flushed down from that point on. What does that mean? Is that bullish or is it bearish? The answer is it is bearish. On top of that, the chart lost 995 for support. So you got a double whammy for the stock. The next destination is going to be down. Perhaps we got 950. That is support an important support, I should say. If that doesn't work out, then we got 886. We'll take it one day at a time. Tulips, BTC, what's going on here? Not touching it. We have a bear flag formation. We have a risk off, it appears so, at least for now, meaning you're not going to do good buying Bitcoin right now. You got to see a pop above 42,000 and on significant volume on top of that, plus a risk on mode in the rest of the market. Then we will see Bitcoin moving higher. And by the way, they say, here's a study for you, all of you Tulip fans, it says Bitcoin fans are psychopaths who don't care about anyone. Study shows. Let me know in the comments if you're a psychopath or not. But here it is, AMC, an hourly chart, two hours chart, I should say. It is stalling for now. It should move higher, but it's not. There is no momentum. There is no energy. It is risk off. The good news is the chart is keeping 14.24 support. The good news is the implied volatility is down in the toilet and the majority of the selling should be done right now. So any hint of risk on in the equities market, this chart could explode higher on short covering. But we're not there yet. If we continue to have risk off, we could see an ugly week for AMC. But the apes better cross their fingers in hope that we will start to see some short covering in the recent drop from around, let's say, 35 all the way down to 18 now. That's a massive profit. Somebody has to book those profits. Moving on to the conclusion of this video. What do we have on the economic calendar this week? On Monday, we have the Home Builders Index. Tuesday, April 19th, we have building permits and housing starts. Wednesday, April 20th, we have existing home sales and the Fed's Beige Book. And they call it the Beige Book due to the sweat, the hand sweat 
when they pass the book around because they're all nervous right now. On Thursday, April 21st, we have the initial jobless claims plus leading economic indicators. And lastly, on Friday, April 22nd, we have the manufacturing PMI and the services PMI. Both will be important. And lastly, what do we have on the earnings calendar? Monday, we have Bank of America. This will be important. And I am bullish Bank of America. And the reason is it benefits more than JP Morgan Chase and Citibank, Wells Fargo, and the rise of yields. But we'll see how these results come out. Tuesday, Tuesday, we have Johnson & Johnson, IBM, watch out for IBM and the exposure to Russia, and then Netflix. Netflix will be the most important earnings, a make or break. If it comes out good, the Qs, the Nasdaq, will rebound higher. If not, we will see another shoe to drop. Wednesday, we have Procter & Gamble, United Airlines, Alcoa, Tesla, the most important earnings, due to the entanglement with Twitter, of course. Then we have Lamb Research and Carvana. Carvana, could it be too bad, it's good. We already got the negativity out of CarMax. We'll see. Thursday, we have AT&T, Freeport McMoran, the name that I own. It's an important telltale for the Chinese economy and the demand on copper. Then we have American Airlines, Blackstone. Let's hope for a good outcome for Blackstone. By a good outcome, I mean a crash. Then we have Philip Morris. This is an important name, and the reason is the exposure to Russia. We need to see the damages. And lastly, we have Snapchat. On Friday, we have uh, American Express, an important earnings for the health of the consumer and spending. Then we have Verizon, Kimberly Clark, another important name for necessities for the consumer. Price gouging, inflation, all of these will be important in Kimberly Clark's earnings. Then we have Newmount, another gold miner, along with Cleveland Cliffs, which I know a lot of you are involved in. And with that, folks, we're done here. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. I will talk to you again tomorrow.